Hi, Grace Foley. Thank you so much for joining me on the Mary Jess Meets podcast. How are you doing today? Hi, Mary Jess. I'm good. I'm good. I am coming to you today from a, a very dark day in County Kerry in the southwest of Ireland. It's just, I can't figure out if that's what July is meant to look like. I'm pretty sure not. So you are, you're brightening up my day already. <laughs> <laughs> That's very kind of you to say that. And I guess your ring light is doing a very good job as well. Cause you just said you've got one of those ring light things that helps with yes. filming. It, yeah. I, I would be lost without it. I would be sitting here in basic darkness right now if I didn't have this on me. So uh, it's, it's, it's my new baby and I'm really enjoying it so far. <laughs> well, you've upgraded quite a bit of tech recently. Cause you said to me just before we started recording that your mic setup is all new as well. Yes. So new that I don't know what to do with it yet. I know we've checked and it's, it's doing something anyway. It's this, road microphone thing i'm re as you can hear i'm really technical about things <laughs> so, <laughs> i do have my new baby i have not figured out how it works yet and uh, i have tried looking at a couple of screens that have so many buttons and dials on them that i quickly turned it off again and just looked at my ring light in awe and thought that i can work that so that's my plan for the next couple of weeks is to figure oh out oh my gosh yeah. we sound so similar we do because I, I get so scared by technology I've just I've, I've said this before I'm I try to get on well with technology like I try so hard to have a good relationship and it's just gone you know what Mary Jess we don't want to be friends it's not, <laughs> it's not in fact I've got a um a very good example of when technology has said to me I don't want to be your friend anymore um and that was when I was recording a live show for a live album that I was hoping to be able to use it for. The um, sound engineer had it all on his laptop. He was about to transfer it onto my hard drive, but my hard drive was formatted for Mac and his was a PC. So we then had to find a different hard drive to then be able to transfer it onto my computer. That hard drive planted a virus onto his machine, crashed everything and we lost all of the recordings. Oh my God. It was all gone. Everything. Oh God. So I oh just God. recorded a whole live album um, and we lost everything. <laughs> oh, I don't even have words to describe what that must have been like. Oh my it makes God. me want to cry. Oh, well, I either laugh or I cry. And I did cry. I did. Oh, I cried <laughs> for days. I mean, I, I think I, I'm nearly crying thinking about that happening to anybody. <laughs> I know. So it then meant that I had to do it all over again um, and in different places. It was a whole great big rework of everything um but thankfully i've recorded it now <laughs> okay and i done. have the wav file stems to be able to use so thank goodness we were able to do it again but gutted does is not like that word doesn't even cut it like devastation i can't even imagine that that's that's yeah. the one of the worst stories i've ever heard yeah definitely. <laughs> definitely. Okay. so um yes my uh, my relationship with technology is, um, shall we say, tense and frayed at the best of times. So I, <laughs> I do, I feel for you, um, one hundred percent. We're dealing okay, with technology course. and learning. We're, we're about kindred it. spirits that way. Yeah, okay, <laughs> absolutely, one hundred percent. But as part of our jobs, as self-employed singers, we have to deal with technology a lot. Mm. So when it, even when it comes to a little home studio setup like what you've got, we need to be able to know how to use that and then when I've been on tour I need to know quite a big amount about PA systems and sound systems even though they boggle my brain to yeah. be honest <laughs> yeah we're, we're not we're not taught but I certainly wasn't taught anything about this I mean you're taught about breath control and performing and and languages and there and that's vitally important but I think like if I was to suggest someone get educated as a singer now I would definitely include this you have to be able to like record you have to be able to make videos you have to be able to control your taxes which i hate even more than sound equipment anything with figures i never thought i'd have to look at that advertising you have to be able to do so many different businesses in one it's like singing is only a very small part of what we do i think in terms of the creativity yeah absolutely right and you touched on quite a few other things there as well like taxes for example why they don't teach you that at school i have no idea and yeah, then um they just want to keep the accountants in business is probably what it is 
yeah. We're yeah. all just scared and saying, you take care of this. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They want to keep us all in that scared mind frame. So we hand it over. Um, yes. But no, it's also like social media stuff, online marketing, trying to get yourself out there so that people can discover you because it's all well and good having great breath control and, and knowing what you're doing when you're performing and singing. But if nobody's going to pay for that art that you've studied, how are you going to buy food? Yeah, I, I, and it's so, so and it, there's so much free stuff out there that we've all had to do and we all do. And it's part of our job for promotion. I think it's trying to ever, and I don't know if we can strike the balance between promotion in order to get our names out there and trying to make a living. And I think it's a really hard balance to make. I just, I don't know if you find that as well, but it's just trying to get that balance between trying to put out as much free stuff as we can without everything being free, you know? Yeah, hundred percent. But it's, it is going more that way now in the music industry, yeah. isn't it? Like you make an album and then because it's got to be on your YouTube and your Spotify and all those kinds of places, you've spent thousands of pounds creating this music to then have to give it away for free because you don't have another choice. You have to be on these platforms in order for people to find you or to be taken seriously or, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and yet there's no return on that unless you've got like a gazillion billion streams or whatever. But then it's yeah. still a like, teeny tiny amount of just a penny that you get from a, a stream. Yeah. So it's, you've got to know all these other things that we've just been speaking about in order to then know how to make some of that money back <laughs> from this yeah. massive investment that you've made. Like I was talking to Anna Hawkins on the podcast um, and we were saying about just how much it costs to make music um, yeah. and how if you were to say it to a businessman, go, look, we've got to spend. So I said on, on that podcast, I said, my prayer to a snowflake album, just the music so none of the legal contracts that had to be written up, none of the um, licenses that had to be bought, none of the physical copies being made, um, none of the artwork or graphic design, none of that other stuff, just the music was £10,000. So if you say to people, and that's like, that's not an elaborate album. The idea of that was that it was supposed to allow the voice to be its own instrument. So I didn't have that many instrumentalists on it. Right. As soon as you get an orchestra on there, it's like, how long's a piece of string? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and That's where's my winning room. lottery ticket? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but like, I said that during the podcast and the reaction that I've had is, and you have to give that away for free. How do you make any money? You, you don't. It's just, it's, it's people have no, people don't realize, I don't think and it's not, it's just because it's not spoken about. It's nobody's fault, but people never and even other singers like when I, I came into this this game um in terms of you know my last project was well my last big project was my album Unleashed this one here uh shameless plug behind me and uh it was uh I went into it knowing it was going to cost money but I went into it knowing that I wanted to put out there what I am and who I am and what I really stand for as a, as a singer and that was this um but when I spoke to another singer afterwards who was like oh my god I love your album and it's just amazing and you did a launch and everything and they said like how much when I told them how much the whole thing cost ish that was kind of for everything they just went white in the face and that was another <laughs> singer and that was that was me before I remember that moment of just like what and then it was, what's really funny is somebody actually recently said to me um i done a tour last year and they said to me would you not do that venue again soon and i was like um well i have to wait until i can afford it and they're like what do, you, what do you mean but like would they what do you mean they wouldn't book you a second time i said they didn't book me for that one i i paid for that venue and i lost money and they were like they couldn't like every concert i've done when i tell people i'm the only person that didn't get paid they're just like what? But I said, yeah, but I'm the one up there trying to build a build a name for myself. So therefore, I am obviously going to be the only one. Because I always say as well, like, um, it's rare somebody needs a singer. But I feel like I always need a pianist or a drummer or a guitarist or something. So it's very rare someone's like, our group needs a singer because singers start groups. So it's, it's, it's a hard one to get. I find, I don't know if you feel the same, that as a singer, you really have to push your personal, your personality and your your vibe and everything really strong because you're trying to sell yourself other people aren't going to bring you in I don't think unless it's another singer for a duet or something I don't know do you find that as well yeah I know exactly what you mean and I think in this current climate the way things are now when people share so much of their lives on social media if you don't share something there are going to be people who like your music but they won't be able to get that strong connection with you that they'll be able to get when you share more of yourself um mm -hmm. 
And the best way that I describe that to people who are, who are worried about sharing so much of themselves mm -hmm. is that what you're trying to do is you're trying to build friendships. Yeah. And so if you want to find fans and a following, you have to build friendships with each one of them. Like, would you be good friends with somebody who, let's say they're an artist and you've just seen their paintings, would you be good friends with them? Or if they're a musician and you've just heard their recordings, well, you wouldn't because yeah. you haven't built that personal connection. Mm -hmm. So it depends on what you want, really. I mean, I, I think before you were able to just release an album and people would love you for the music and for the album and they wouldn't be able to know that much more about you because there wasn't all this social media stuff. Yeah. But now you get so many people that just expect that of you. And when they yeah. can't build a personal relationship with you, they just go to somebody else who is given that. Absolutely. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, that makes total sense. It's, you do have to make that connection with people. Um, it's, it's vital. I didn't do as much of it. I'm very, I'm very, very um, present on social media now, but like a few years ago, when I brought out my first album, like I'm trying to think, I did just about had a professional Facebook page. I don't even think my own Facebook page ever gets any look in because I, I don't have time <laughs> for that page at all. And I'm actually friends with loads of the people that follow me have befriended me as well. So I think that they'll just be seeing the same thing twice. Uh, but I, and the friendship part of it, absolutely. Like I've had some people follow me like on every single, I've done some live concerts on Facebook on numerous pages. Um, Cause fair enough, I did some on my own page and obviously they were at that, but they followed me on my little tour from the exact same spot in my sitting room uh, all around the world on a little Facebook live tour. And it's those same people. So it does work. It, it works both ways because seeing them pop up when possibly no one else was willing to comment. Like I've often seen a live stream come up and I don't know the artist. I might pop on for a while. I might, and I might even listen for a good while. I may not comment, but your own fans will come on and they'll say, hi, love your dress. How are you keeping? Love this song. I've heard you sing. This is my favorite of yours. I mean, so it can't, we get an awful lot, I find, with, the, with a certain number of people an awful lot back from them as well the, the ones that you make friends with that makes sense yes no it does it does and I treasure those relationships that I've got as well because for ages I was worried about putting more of myself out there on social media and I think that stems from an insecure place as an artist because when you're putting out stuff that you've poured your heart and your soul into um, and you've written songs that are really personal about really personal stuff and then you're putting it out to the world that's really scary and oh, yeah. so like putting out more of yourself and more of what's really means a lot to you and what's really personal just makes it even more scary and so it did take me a while to to feel okay with it and to feel comfortable with it mm -hmm. but then as soon as I started sharing more of my stories and as soon as I started sharing more of well just me really I felt like the relationships I were getting back just made it so worth it because yeah. I had these great fans and these great friendships with these fans. And I just, I love that. I feel so blessed to have that. And so even though it is scary, I'm glad that I took that leap of faith <laughs> to try it. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think there is a comfort, as you said, in knowing that you have them. And also, I suppose when you put out music, even if like I've, I'm starting to write more music, but even choosing a cover of a song, I'm a big believer. Obviously, we, we choose songs that we hope the public will like. But, you know, also, I think our choice of songs is a reflection of our personalities. And if people get to know you for you, minus the music, you're hoping that then they would even further understand your choice of picking certain songs. And they, the two come together. I think it's quite hard. Uh, like even in a live performance, remember the days when we used to perform in front of people um, and you walk out. And I don't know if you find this, but there's the first certainly the first two songs and you're on and they're all strangers bar the obligatory family members and friends that are sitting down the back making whoop noises but apart from them <laughs> there's just these people that are kind of they're not they're there and they're smiling but they're, they're not yours yet and there's this beautiful moment which is what I miss the most of when you win them over you might tell a joke or you might t sing a song they love and after about three songs you're together and you know them whereas you kind of have that all the time, I think, with your online people because they're, you have them one over and you have them every day and they interact with you. Um, what I do miss most, I suppose, is the live element of catching people and that terrifying first or, first or second song where you're going, oh God, are you going to like me, guys? Are you going to be really quiet? Are you going to... And then they come with you and you're like, yes. So at the moment when we can't do that, it's even more important to treasure these people that are online and we've got them one over 
every single day. Yes, 100%. And um, I think it's nice to remember those feelings for when you're trying to do a live stream. Um, I haven't done too many yet, um, just because the technology kind of scares me going back to technology. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, so, but I, I have been thinking about trying to do something. Um, but when you don't have the audience there in front of you to feed off um, and you don't have that atmosphere, it does mean that live streams can be very difficult because you don't have that energy and you don't, you don't know how you're being received. Um, but I just try and when I have sung online before, I've just thought, well, if there's not many people who can join me live straight away, you're performing for people who can watch later. Yes, um, and important. so it's yeah. Yeah. bearing them in mind as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that kind of helps me a little bit because then I'm thinking, well, you know, more people will see this later when they've got time. It's just that's the way that social media works. Yeah. So you are performing for those people. And even though they're not with you right now, or even though they're not with you in person right now, they will see mm. it. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to win them over in, in a live, like, like you would in a live concert. But yeah. it, is, it is difficult getting used to the fact that when you've finished performing a song, there's crickets it's tough it's very tough and then the odd time there's no comment either <laughs> <laughs> and you're going ah. <clears throat> okay hi everyone's still there it's just, it is i i found it i wouldn't know i would say 50 50 i would say maybe 70 30 70 being great uh 30 being the negative side of doing online performances i found in the last couple of weeks um i got sick of looking at my own face i really genuinely did i was like i just and i suppose i got a little bit at the start of this, I thought, I'm so glad I'm doing it because it gets, it gives you the opportunity to keep performing and get that energy up, as you said, and so you don't lose that. But then I thought, I don't want to lose my ability to sing to actual people. And I don't want it to become a thing that I become so used to this, that the opposite happens, that I find it really hard when there's actual people there. Now, having said that, I, I can't imagine that changing. It's just, I can't wait to perform, even if it's five people. And I'm not just saying that, it's just the idea of someone being here, because even I've had a couple of family members um, now that we can be around a couple of people um, said like, oh, do you want me to will I sit in while you're doing your online performance? And I thought, no, because, you know, that's just going to be a bit confusing because I still have to look at myself. <laughs> and then you're there as well. And it's just, it's a bit weird. But um, I did do a broadcast from a cathedral in Killarney and it was just incredible. It was over the parish webcam. So it went out and I couldn't that was strange in that I couldn't see my own face. I couldn't see comments. There was no comments. There was no way of watching back. I never saw it. But what was amazing is I didn't feel like I was alone there. I felt like they were all in this cathedral with me because I chose songs that were about healing. And that was massively, massively important to me that that performance was just, I'll never forget that. But I did say yesterday to my husband, I said, I need to plan something for this year. Even if, uh, even if at the moment it maybe feels like will it happen a, a, a live performance because I said if someone said to me you can do that same thing at Christmas to an empty cathedral no one will be there I don't know if I could face into planning that again I just think I'd need some even, as I said even and they could do that there now it's huge if there was 10 people like at the back even because <laughs> I know singing is dodgy with with the coronavirus situation it's we're a very dangerous sport at the moment um so yeah it's it's gas singing is dangerous <laughs> <laughs> which is I don't know if you thought about that much or like planning public performances or anything like that no I've actually cancelled mine oh they're all done for the year yeah yeah no it's just I just well I cancelled them when lockdown came in because there was already talk about a second wave um and I just I couldn't bear the thought of spending so much time and energy and money organizing something that would just have mm. to be cancelled anyway um so I thought I'll just cancel my my Christmas tour dates because um, I had a few solo ones and then I had some that I was going to do with Joanna Forrest for our Christmas at the musicals. Oh, oh um, who's mug? Look, I'm actually using that mug. Oh, I love it. <laughs> this, is, um, this is one that Joanna made me um, as a thank you for organising oh, the dates, um, oh. which is so nice of her. So it's like my favourite mug now. <laughs> oh, um, that's but yeah, we were we were supposed to be doing some Christmas at the musicals tour dates as well. And I just said to her, I'm so, I just can't like, it just takes so much time and energy and effort and money to organize tour dates to then have them canceled would 
break my heart. So I just thought while everything is going so completely, yes, I'll just cancel them now and save myself the stress. But it has also made me sad because I'm thinking, well, it would be nice to have something in the diary to look forward to. Yeah. <laughs> that's the, that's right kind of, that's the way I'm nothing. feeling. You know? Nothing. That's, that's freaking me out. I know. <laughs> um, it's re especially I'm a Christmas not there's no words to describe how big into Christmas I am and the thought of not sharing music at Christmas as I said not even not planning a tour or anything but even just one day somewhere in some big church or something where there could be a few people I just need to do something or even just to look forward or planning something um for the end of this year there's something psychological about finishing out the year with music I think um and the thought of doing it only online is just not sitting well with me at the moment but maybe that's because I'm having a bad COVID week <laughs> but it's up until, up until recently I thought this is great and it has like we probably we may not have done this maybe we would have I don't know but there's lots of things that have happened that would definitely not have happened or certainly wouldn't have arisen for a while yet due to this lockdown because people are connecting and the music world has gotten a lot smaller and I've had connections with people that I've never met before um well I suppose I still haven't met but that kind of thing uh but and that kept me going it's just the last few days I've thought how much longer until people will hear us and get to do this and get to smile and get to sway and get to react. I just, that's make it's just, it's the lack of reaction with someone's face and just, uh, yeah, it's just that crickets at the end of your performance, the sound of silence. Hello, darkness, my old friend. is <laughs> <laughs> yeah. hard to tolerate long-term, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And um, for the other thing that, to bear in mind with performances is like now in the UK, we've been told that soon we'll be able to do a concerts outside. Mm -hmm. um, but, but then it's like, what's the weather going to be doing? Are oh, you going to have to cancel it anyway? Um, yeah. Do people who have been furloughed and have now lost their jobs, do they have money to pay for tickets? No. Um, nope. And then are these people who enjoy our kind of music who tend to be the older in the generation, in the generations, are they going to want to come out? and enjoy music yeah. with a group of people. I wouldn't. Yeah. So it just, there's so many things that are out of our control, even though the government is saying, yeah, fine, you can do it to X amount of people now. You go, well, those X amount of people are probably not going to show up. No, I, I that, totally agree. I was thinking that same thing. How is it going to work? I mean, I think the weather where you are is better than here. I mean, I'm in Killarney, which is probably one of the most beautiful parts of Ireland, and it's, it's, it's known to be, but it's the wettest I think it's probably one of the wettest parts of Ireland. Just like this actual town is wetter than other parts of Kerry. Um, so like you said, the weather, um, the cost of doing an outside performance. I mean, it depends what level. Like I've got my own speakers. They're about that big and they're fine for, for even in churches to a certain extent. Uh, but they're not meant for big outdoor. So do you have to get a stage? Do you have to rent a stage? Do you have to rent sound? And then in terms of the whole income part of things, because we are not allowed to work, um, in Ireland, we're on this very small amount of money per week just to keep us going, which is good, but we're not meant to be working. So if we then charge people to come to hear us, are we then going to be in trouble for working? I don't know. It's just, it's so confusing. It's so, so confusing. So it's just, we're, we're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place at the moment, I think. Goodness me, that's so difficult, isn't it? Yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Wow. Um, well, can I go back and talk to you about something that you mentioned? You mentioned performing in a church for a live stream for your community. That's mm. such a lovely thing to do. Yeah. That's yeah, so nice was, of you it, to it, donate your time like that and do it for people. And it must, oh, singing again must have felt great. <laughs> oh, God, singing again with an actual pianist. I can't describe my excitement. When he started playing, I was like, <gasps> like I, I on a selfish note that was amazing for me um it with again I'm I very much believe in energy and I'm a very spiritual person I'm a religious person and at the start I I've sung most of my life in churches that's kind of where I actually feel very happy um I started singing in a folk group believe it or not uh, not a choir when I was 14 um and then I went on to lead that group in my 20s I had to leave it for a while and it kind of disbanded because I was in college and everything so it it, it went away um, like a lot of groups do because people were in college and studying so it, it stopped and when I came back to Kerry I'd actually taken a break from singing um, due to personal circumstances at the time I just I walked away from music and I found myself there was a numerous different things I can't say it was one thing I always say the song Falling Slowly maybe saved me a little bit because that song was just guided me back that's that's another story I 
started teaching singing. So my own students at the time definitely brought me back into it. I found that quite painful though, because I wasn't really singing myself. Um, it was actually with this group in the church, uh, my local church here, that I found myself able to sing again. Uh, because my reason, I always say to what's your reason? Um, my reason for singing had gone. And that was what happened. I had no reason to sing anymore. I think for years, I was a little bit heartbroken. And I think singing comes from the heart. And when that's broken in terms of music, it just won't work. And being back in the church, you've got all these people who are sitting there needing to hear this message and needing maybe just an escape. You've people there that maybe, maybe they're planning on giving up going to the church. There's some people, you just see them, they've lost it. They're just sitting there and they've been dragged along. And maybe one song would just make them you know, feel better about themselves or feel more connected to other people. And I just found that so incredible. And I suppose I found that the church gave an awful lot to me. The church has always thanked me, um, but I always feel very grateful to them for that because it's just where I felt most, it's nothing to do with me when I sing in the church. It's nothing to do for, with me when I sing at a funeral. It's, it's my job and it's my existence, I guess, to just kind of convey this message. And it's something I felt very, very strongly about for years and years and years. And uh, even like I used to organize concerts for AWARE, which is a mental health uh, charity at Christmas. And I, even that, I was remembering that so fondly the other day and they all thanked me. And I thought, again, I'm, I'm loving giving this because I'm getting an awful lot back as well. And at the start of this year, I felt I hadn't done any of that in a while. And I said to a friend of mine, I said, oh my God, I need to do something with the church. Something's gonna happen this year. I need to do something. And she said, I, said, I don't know what it is. I need to do something where I'm actually providing healing but I have no idea. And we're trying to figure out all these different jobs. And I was like, it's not a concert. And it was like, again, like I knew, or I just felt something. And I said, I need to do something this year. It's not going back to sing at mass because I just can't make the commitment because I'm not always around. And then when this happened, I contacted my local priest um, who actually um, performed my wedding ceremony, um, Father Niall Howard. And I said, can I sing on, like live in the cathedral, close the doors and I'll sing songs of hope and healing. And he got, he got back to me after a while and he said, it's a runner. And like, it's, it was, it's definitely one of my most memorable experiences I've ever had in my entire life. And I think that that type of music, um, I don't know if you're aware, you probably know Liam Lawton's, Father Liam Lawton's music. I sang some of that. And um, you've got the, obviously the, the Ave Maria, the Pants Angelicus. I finished up with You Raise Me Up. Um, I read a lovely poem by a, a, Perry, uh, a Kerry poet um, called Brendan Kennelly. It's called Begin, which is a lovely po poem as well. If you look it up, if you haven't heard it. Um, so I suppose that was, that's one of my highlights of this whole time because I felt the need to do something like that from the start of this year. And it finally made sense to me. So I don't know if you're a spiritual person, but I really felt that the, everything had kind of aligned in that moment. That's amazing. It's so great when stuff like that does align as you've said because then it really does make you feel like it's all happened for a reason and you're in the right place doing the right thing and that's always something that makes you feel good um but there's so many different bits in that <laughs> what you just said that i'd love to go back to um so you said yes. about um being in a folk group first of all that's really cool what kind of what how did you get into that and what kind of stuff were you doing um, well, I suppose in primary school, I wasn't involved in music in a big way because I'm actually may not seem it, but I'm at my core, a relatively shy person. I just work really hard to not come across that. Way. <laughs> so in school, in primary school, I always sang at home. And I think my parents probably found it frustrating that I probably, uh, I suppose I was so shy in school that I never, ever pushed it. But at home, you could not shut me up. Uh, but then in front of family, they'd say, oh, Grace, will you sing something? And after hours, and I mean hours of cajoling, um, everyone would have to turn around. I'd probably turn around and face the other direction and then I might sing. So I suppose when I came to secondary school, my voice um, had gotten bigger and bigger and I just started training. And uh, I was starting to kind of get a little bit of a name as somebody who can sing. And I was approached by um, a person who lives uh, very close to me and she said, like, I'm running a folk group. And I thought, what's a folk group? Um, I, I suppose she called it a folk choir at the time. Uh, oh. So I had a really, really weird background into music because I always say that the classical music, I was classically trained, but an awful lot of my experience of music, bar my time studying, has been anything but classical. Uh, a folk group, you're given a sheet with lyrics. And I have a really good ear and I can learn things like that. But my sight reading is still not great. Uh, because I think probably because of this. But we, I felt like we learned songs because of the meaning of them and we felt them and we were like, oh my God, the words, you're so focused on lyrics. 
that you can't, the music washes over you. Um, and then now I'm not great with harmony. I have to admit that I was never great at it. Uh, but I suppose my music, my musicianship was never amazing uh, because of the fact that I, my education in music was, was lyrics, but the music, it's just like the Jesuits and like, as I said, Liam Lawton and just so many Eddie Hall come towards the end. I've kind of discovered her, an American artist. And I just, Oh, the music is to me that's where my heart is in great lyrics i love a ballad i, I, I love a ballad um choral music has never really bar in college been part of my life so that's kind of my my folk group story <laughs> if you will yeah i think it's great when other musicians start from other places or they go into other places because music can take you in so many different genres um and i've often said that that's why i've chosen crossover as my desired genre is just because I like being able to take inspiration from loads of different places um, and stick it all together. It's yeah. so much fun to be able to do that. Um, so do you think that your folk background has influenced you in your, in your now more classical genre? Definitely, um, definitely. Uh, my, my experience, as I said, of classical music was the fact that like when I started training, there was only, like there was a singing teacher um, she was to this day the best singing teacher. Oh my God, she she actually passed away a few years ago. Her name was Anya Nagawan, and she was just the best tech, technical teacher. She was like my mom at the time, my second mom, um, and she gave me a great background. So I kind of got introduced to classical music because of the fact that I was classically trained. You know, I didn't ever decide to be a classical singer. I always said that I always wanted to sing, um, and I got trained that way. Um, a lot of my time in the classical world felt a little bit like I was a tiny bit off sync because I go to the folk group at the weekends and as I said when I was studying I eventually had to walk away from it unfortunately which was heartbreaking because I loved it and I always felt really connected and really like I'm in a line this is me I want to be singing this stuff I feel it I understand it it's my heart and then I felt that with oratorio um in the classical world because that was kind of fit into that same thing I loved English song I loved leader um opera I know it's awful and I, and I loved, I did certain parts of it and I loved it, but it was just never me. I was always a little bit off step, I felt with the classical world and everyone was coming in and going, oh my God, I discovered this aria. And I would go home in the evening and listen to Glenn Hansard and the, fr and the Frames and Damien Rice and Lana Del Rey and that Coldplay. And I was listening that I loved good songs, good lyrics. And I just, I felt a bit off. So maybe the folk group, part of my life was actually a really good fit for me. And maybe then the choir in the, in this, in the, 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 the Royal Irish Academy of Music is where I studied. I didn't straight away click. I didn't feel emotionally clicked um, with that world, especially the opera side of it. I was the only person in our final year who decided to keep up oratorio and drop opera. I think in the history of the whole course, no one had done that. <laughs> and they were like, what, are you crazy? Like the life of a singer is in the opera world. And I felt quite, disconnected from that part I don't know I don't know why I think maybe it's my background or maybe it's just like who I am as a person so I suppose my decision to be a classical crossover singer wasn't a decision um I think it was the fact that I'm I sing this way there's no point in me trying to sing any other way because I have a very classical heavy voice I've ever, I can't hide that I don't have a life voice so it just sounds really classical but my choice of song is from here I think and the voice is just the way I was trained if that makes any sense yeah, it does. And um, you're probably speaking to the perfect person to understand what you've just said as well, because um, if I do say so myself, uh, it's because um, I grew up singing rock songs at karaoke's with my mum. And so right. the only time that I would sing classical stuff was for my exams at school, because yeah. that's how you took your singing exams, was singing the classical stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but it meant that I do classical stuff, but still my choice of stuff to listen to is 80s power ballads. Holy moly, I love them. Fantastic. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> I just think they're great. Oh, I just, I do. I love a good guitar solo. I love duetting guitars. Oh my goodness, I love it. And my karaoke song still to this day is Guns N' Roses, Sweet Child of Mine. That oh, fantastic. is my karaoke song. <laughs> so. <Fantastic> song. <laughs> So I know exactly what you're saying. Like I've always thought, oh, sugar, maybe I should have gone into rock music and been a rock singer. And But I'm very similar to you. I feel like my voice lends itself to the classical stuff. That's where my voice, yes. I feel, 
that's that's the niche for my voice that's where that's where it's home that um and so I like to bring the drama of 80s rock music into my music and I tried my best to do that with Shine um when I was with Decca and they had the big budget and they could pay for all the instrumentalists and you know <laughs> they had the moolah <laughs> to be able to do that um yeah. <laughs> I really tried to um bring my love of 80s rock music into the classical crossover world and into Shine um and I feel like you can um, hear that in quite a few of the different songs um, but I just I love that drama of it and I love that I can take some of that inspiration and bring it into what I do now um, and it sounds like you feel the exact same way with all of the stuff that you've done in the past but yeah I, I still listen to tons of other stuff other than opera <laughs> yeah. um, and it just I think it's good to have an eclectic mix though it's good to listen to lots of different things and because that's it definitely, it definitely is it's also how you learn, isn't it? You go, oh, well, that's really cool. I like that. Maybe I can yep. use it in this way. Um, or I might try singing this song in a different way. So like when you pick a cover song, for example. Um, but yeah, I actually, I did a cover a little while ago and I really want to work out a way to bring it out again of um, Since You've Been Gone by Rainbow. And I... Oh love that song I mean it's got key changes and guitar solos uh it's amazing um but the lyrics are so emotional and so sensitive but you don't really hear the lyrics when it's got all this crazy amazing rock stuff around it um, yeah, yeah 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 so I think it's good to listen to other things and then see what speaks to you and then you can make really cool covers in your own way and you were saying that earlier um about how you choose covers so it sounds like you feel the same way as me about it Absolutely. And I think I 100% agree that we need to have different influences then because it's very easy to put ourselves into a box or to be put into a box. I mean, I was told when I was younger, I'm a contralto, so I have the lowest female voice. Um, and I was told that. And for a long time, that really limited me. And it was no one's fault because everyone who was around me, including my teacher, was like, you've got a way bigger range than you allow yourself to have. But I, have, I was like, I have a low voice. And that really kind of, I think I stopped myself and then I'm a classical singer and I kind of felt I couldn't, these are boxes I put myself into, I'm very aware of that. Um, but I felt, oh, oh, I'm just stuck inside here and I can't move. And I, it's quite claustrophobic. Whereas when I left um, music and stepped away from singing, um, my, the, the friendships I struck up just so happened to be, well, actually with some people that have nothing to do with music, which was very refreshing. Um, and then some traditional Irish musicians and they're great because they've just got this total freedom within, well, within reason, they've obviously got structures, but like they're, they're just sitting there and they're just feeling every note and they can finish the tune bang on together. No one's nodding, no one's conducting. It's just that, that just ear they have. And I, I'm hoping some of that rubbed off on me. And even now, I suppose I spend so much time working with people who don't read sheet music and just, you come in and they're like, what key is it in? You barely have to know what key it's in because they'll just hear you sing one note and they're like, yeah, grand. I then find myself at the moment trying to figure out um, who I'm working with and other different things and their pianists who need sheet music. And suddenly I realize I've gone from being the person who has sheet music for everything to being the person who has sheet music for nothing. I'm kind of going, oh God, because I'm so used to it. Nearly every pianist, bar one, I think, that I've worked with on weddings and things, they just need a key. And they have this one sheet of paper and they write down the names of the songs, the running order and a key. And at the start, I couldn't cope. I was like, you're going to forget something. But they don't need to really remember many things because it's just, they're in the moment, which, and it doesn't have to be perfect, which is, I'm sure you'll agree, very hard to take in as a classically trained singer. You're like, what, what, what? But it needs to be, it needs to be perfect. And it, it doesn't. And that's a lesson that I, I still teach a few students, um, not at the moment, obviously, but uh, I always try and instill that. Try and get everything to the highest degree you can. But if it's not perfect, it's okay. If, if something goes wrong on the day. And I think I learned that lesson from traditional music, I think. Mm. Yeah. I, I can't remember who I was talking to you about this. I think I've said it a couple of times now. Um, but if a performance is perfect, mm -hmm. you lose some of the feeling. Like if you're constantly thinking about that note has to be here, bang on, like this. You just, you don't want to sound like a robot. You want to sound like yeah. a, a human person with emotions and feelings. Like, do you know yeah. what I mean? And then yeah, absolutely. if you've got a perfect bang on performance like this, it just, you lose that emotion and that connection that you can forge with people. Um, yeah. And so I remember being so afraid of not doing everything perfect, but it just, 
you lose the emotion with it. So I, I completely agree. I mean, it took me ages to get past that point. I was like, no, it's got to be perfect every time. Um, but when I've been recording live songs for my YouTube channel, there have been ones that have been bang on perfect. Um, but then I've actually opted for another take that's not bang on perfect because the emotion right. is so much better. And it's, it's that emotional connection that you want to get with your audience. Absolutely. And you want to yep. feel that through the music. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah, I completely agree with you there. It, though it is difficult as a classical musician because you like trained to make sure everything is, yeah, bang on every time. <laughs> every time. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, especially because you just like, heaven forbid, you should hold a note written by Mozart on a, just a millisecond longer than he wrote it. Oh. You'd, be, you'd be sent home, you know? Oh, you would. Passing. Yeah, with no dinner as well. Sent straight to bed, no dinner. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> yeah. But that's another reason for loving crossover as well, because you do have more flexibility with it. And I have always fought so hard against those walls that people want to pigeonhole you into. Like, I put up a post on my social media, I think ages ago now, um, saying um, a quote from one of my grandma's old singing books that is my favourite quote. I love it. And it is that the voice has the ability and the power to paint in sound the color of human emotions. Oh, beautiful. And I love that. And I just, I said in this post on social media, I said, when has human emotions ever fitted into a box? Mm -hmm. When has human emotions ever fitted into a pigeonhole? If you want a singer to fit into a box and a pigeonhole so you know where they are, which the industry always wants to do, mm -hmm. how are they going to be able to paint the breadth of human emotions just from in this one little box it doesn't work yeah um yeah. so that was basically then me allowing myself to put up all these other things that i love and i started putting up rock music onto my youtube channel um and it actually got the most amazing response because i was thinking oh but that's not why people have followed me they want to hear the classical stuff but actually they find my background in rock music interesting they want to hear the rock stuff like i was so happy about that <laughs> You're, you're being real you're being yourself that people want that you know yeah exactly so when you're talking about not wanting to fit into a box 100 percent understand what you're saying right yeah and it's also the the connection that you get with people from being your real self and saying but i can do other things that just makes yeah. you more interesting it does it does it's very i think it's just i think we're definitely in agreement on this one it's so important, it's so important. <laughs> yeah um, but I'd love to talk to you more about writing your own songs because I don't think there are too many classical crossover singers who actually write their own music. And um, oh. it's amazing that you do that. So can we talk more about your, your process of writing? You've said that um, sheet music's not really your favourite thing. And for me, that is not how I write at all. I'm not sat yeah. there with some sheet music and a pen going, well, here's the A and then it's going to go to the... No. <laughs> It's a, uh, yeah, it's, it, it, again, we're not, I, 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 I'm not, and I'm not putting down my background because it's, it definitely is a background that works, but we were taught chord five, chord one, and your cadence, and this, and your plagal cadence, and your perfect cadence, and that, and it's very hard, I think, to get out of that, so when I started writing, I was actually recording my last album, and I don't know how I come up in conversation, but I said, oh, I'd love to try, I like writing, I like writing, um, when I was younger, I used to write poetry. I'm sure it wasn't great, but I liked it. And I used to have a column in a local um, kind of magazine and I uh, loved that. And I thought, well, I like writing. So I could try writing music. And the guy I was recording in his studio, this guy called Dave McCune, he said, well, he said, I will be up for, if you want to write some lyrics and I'll see if I can put it to a melody. So that's how it kind of started. And I sat down and it's gas. Looking back on those now, they're very like, this is a poem. And then now that I've started looking at it from the other side, that would never work as a song. So I started that way and I sent him some bits and pieces and we've kind of the start of a couple of songs done, uh, done as in written. Um, his style is more kind of jazzy. Um, and I think I'm trying to find my own voice between, between different genres. Uh, so it's, 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 a, it's an interesting process. There was one song at like one o'clock in the morning, typical artist lying in bed. And this song, to me that sounds really cheesy and actually, <laughs> it's just oh it just came to me in a dream uh it didn't come to me in a dream but it just i don't i can't explain it and that's um i wish that happened all the time um 
I actually think I left the bedroom and went into my phone and just like sang a quick voice note. And I was like, okay, I'll forget this tomorrow if I don't get this out. Um, and that's kind of the first song. That's not recorded. I, 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 I hope I'd record it at some stage. Um, that I wrote all of it and I sent it to Dave and he sent me back kind of a backing to it. So I have like that on my phone. I think two people have heard it. Um, that's my song. Uh, then we recorded a song. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the Simon community. I think they're just in Ireland. They're for the homeless in Ireland. They support the homeless. Wow. And there's a big homeless crisis in Ireland. And it was very topical last year. And I thought I want to just try my hand at writing a song in aid of that charity. So I wrote the lyrics and Dave wrote the melody. And then I kind of preferred, I kind of had an idea for the melody of the chorus and I liked his, or sorry, the verse, and he had a really nice chorus. So we mishmashed. So I actually have had a hand in some of the melody as well as the lyrics. And then the ones I wrote this year, um, Together Apart, is a song I wrote uh, and recorded here in this house. Um, I was wandering around the place, not knowing which end of me was up when we got locked down. And I thought, okay, I, should, I really should like record Wonderful World immediately and send it out into the world and hope that will like try and convey my message. And I thought, oh God, I don't know. I was looking up all these songs on YouTube that I could do a little song into my phone. And, and I thought, why am I not writing down my own feelings? So I sat at the piano. Again, it just happened. Um, and I wrote it and I sent it to Dave again and he put a backing track to it. He sent me a voice recorder in the post. I went into my wardrobe. I put my head in between my jeans and my leggings and I recorded <laughs> it in there. Um, thank God I have this now. Um, uh, when I figure this out and I recorded it and got it mastered and it's been played on a number of different radio stations and it was very real. Uh, what I find now is I'm trying to write songs because I mentioned to you before we started recording that I got some Arts Council funding um, for recording and writing yes. my own music. Congratulations! Uh, thank you! <laughs> so uh, that comes with the added pressure of, oh God, someone believes in me now I actually have to do it. So I've sat there a few times going like, like writing out my chord chart. Um, like in classical world of like chord one, two, three. This one's minor. This is major. What key am I in? Accidentally changing key without meaning to was a habit I had a couple of times. Um, so right now where my writing process is, is I'm trying to get the balance. And I don't know if, and I'd be actually interested to ask you this question if you're doing any writing yourself, is the balance between um, writing what's real, writing what's real to you, and then wondering, will this actually transfer over to the listener and is the melody matching the words and then you're trying to and a, f a few people have asked me in my family as well like what like what audience do you want and like you know what style do you want to be and I'm finding that really tough because it's just me writing and I'm wondering is it going to come across as a classical crossover singer or is it just going to sound like how I felt on that day and then so many songs are so sad because you know pandemic <laughs> so <laughs> like I wrote one recently and uh a member of my family heard it and I was all excited and I was like, what do you think? And they were like, um, silence. And I was like, oh, oh, and they were like, it's really sad. Like I felt really sad after listening to it. It's very real. And I thought, <laughs> yeah. So I just don't know where we find the medium between, you don't want to depress people. I don't think it's depressing, um, but it's my experience of this empty time where we're kind of floating in existence. Um, I don't think during this time, I can just write happy, happy songs because it's not a happy, happy time. So I don't know if you've experienced this kind of wondering who will listen to it feeling. <laughs> yes, I have. And now I choose to religiously ignore it. Yeah, I feel that too. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. And that's because I know that if I'm feeling it, somebody else is bound to be feeling it. That's what I said. Yeah. And if, and if, you're, if your family member is saying it's very real, then blinking brilliant that sounds great <laughs> i love that because it's, it's like we were saying earlier about opening up and being like the real you on social media it's the same in your music even though it's bloody scary to be so real and so raw emotionally in, in your music you're like that's what people connect to yeah every time so i wouldn't give when you're writing a song and when you're putting songs out there it's very difficult, but I wouldn't give two hoots about who you think is going to listen to it. Yeah. Um, or what they're going to think of you. Um, or, <laughs> or if it's too sad. Um, because 
when you're putting something out that is real and is your real feelings and your raw emotion, people will connect with it. Mm-hmm. And the people who will connect with it will then find it as well, especially if you're like doing all the stuff that you're doing already with like having a good social media presence and putting it up on YouTube and all that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I've been, so many people have said to me before, like, who do you want to be as an artist? And who's your audience and all that kind of thing. And I know that works for a marketing point of view but I feel you create the music that you feel is right for you then you look at who is listening to it and that's your audience you don't try and second guess it no like that's my personal feeling um and I think that's the best way to be as well I do because even though even though I understand what people are saying when they say we've got to think about who your audience is Mm -hmm. I don't I understand that if you're writing a song for a brief for somebody yeah. else's music and, and for somebody else's artistry, you know, I get it for that. But when it's your own stuff, it should be a real reflection of you. Yeah. And so you shouldn't think about what all these people are like, because what's that thing? Um, you get a committee of people together and they try and draw a horse and it ends up being a camel. Is <laughs> I think, I think that's a saying somewhere, you know, like, if you've created this beautiful stallion of a horse in a song, and then you get lots of people's ideas to go along with it, the song, if you start writing for what you think other people are going to want, the song's going to end up being a camel. Yes. It, that's, <laughs> so I've never, I've never heard that before, but I like it. <laughs> I, I like, and it makes, it, only in the world of artists would that make total sense. Okay. I, I, I completely agree. And I'm so happy that I have a fellow singer recorded saying the exact same thing as me like it's just <laughs> it's a camel it's gonna be i don't want a camel if i wanted a camel i would have written a camel <laughs> exactly <laughs> oh i'm laughing so much i've got the same color as my top oh. <laughs> oh well i'm glad i explained it to, in a way that you could understand anyway because i'm not sure it made entire sense but yeah <laughs> it did it did <laughs> Oh my gosh. So have you got any stallion songs that are going to be coming out anytime soon? Since you've been writing. Well, that I've written, I'm, the thing is this, this, this funding um, and all the pressure that comes with it, it has to be spent this year. Um, so I mentioned, I can't remember if it was on or, on or off the podcast, but I have recorded, um, I recorded my songs for this year, but there were covers earlier in the year. I recorded Denny Boy, which came out on the 5th of June. I recorded my next song, which I haven't, I'm not mentioning the name of yet. Uh, it's a love song, so that's a, that'll, be a, that'll be a hint. Um, again, it's a cover. Uh, very classical crossover. Um, probably the most crossover thing I've recorded. And then in December, I have a Christmas song coming out. So that's all sorted, and the videos are done, and that's grand. Um, I wasn't planning, but nobody planned for anything this year, on recording anything else. I was like, I know what I'm spending, I know what I'm doing, it's finished. Then I got this funding, which has to be spent by the end of this year. So it's probably a good thing as well that I have that push. And me being me, or what I like, what I could sensibly do is record it this year, and I've got the rest of the year to do it and rec- release whatever it is next year. I'm hoping it'll be at least two songs. Three could be a push. I have to look at the finances of it, but I'm hoping it'll be two songs. I could be sensible and wait to release both of those next year, which would make sense. But there's just this little part of me that's like, there's something about this year that makes me want to release one of them, especially my really super sad song uh, this year. Just in case you're not depressed enough, I will add to that. <laughs> um, just really just push the point home how tough it's been. Uh, I kind of want to do, release a song this year um, and because we have to plan things. Obviously the Christmas song is going to come out at Christmas. Um, now, me being me, I probably could just release it now, but I won't. Uh, but that probably will be December, um, which means that realistically, I would have to have this other song released by October, which would mean having it written and recorded in like the late late on August. Um, so it's just, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the logistics of it. And then there's the joyful realization uh, that this is new music, therefore it does not exist on paper therefore cannot be transferred onto the brains of people who haven't written it, therefore will need to be arranged by somebody. So I'm hoping, I have a producer I worked before who has done that uh, for my last song that I wrote with uh, Dave McCune. So I'm hoping I'll be able to work that out again this time. So it's just at the moment, a teeny tiny bit up in the air in terms of what the songs will be, what they will sound like, when they'll be recorded and when they'll be released. But when I get my mind on something, I'm quite unstoppable. I just had a bit of a week last week where, you know, those weeks where you're kind of a bit flappy. 
and I was sitting down my notebook and I was like, um, and I've yeah. kind of written a song, which I actually sent to Dave as well. He's my, my, my second opinion. And he's like, I really like where it's going. And he said, he's going to give me a hand with a couple of rhythms in it. And then I started a couple of other songs. I started a Christmas song. Obviously I wouldn't be releasing that this year. Um, and I don't know if you've written a Christmas song or if you've tried to, but there's no way around the cheese. Like the cheese is just, you can't, you can't mention winter, snowflake, December, cold, tree, lights, without being like, oh God, is it very cliche? So I kind of started a Christmas song, several Christmas songs, and another song that's a bit more vague and not about the time we're living in. But I'm very conscious. I want to be sure that that's not all the voices in my head telling me to not be so specific about what I'm writing, you know? So I'm just... Yeah, I'm very sure of one song I love. Um, regarding the other ones, I'm not so sure. So that's where I'm kind of at at the moment. Yeah, that, com- that makes complete sense. Because as, as writers, I know that I haven't released everything that I've written. But each song is a discovery, really. I've, um, I really like something that um, Beth Nielsen Chapman said. Um, so she's an amazing American songwriter. Um, and she said that writing a song is like being in a car. So you're in a car and you're on a journey, but you don't know where you're going yet. So you lock your fear in the boot. <laughs> um, because when you're in a songwriting session or when you're writing, you know, you, you might get an idea that you feel is cheesy or, or something. Um, and then you're afraid to write it down because you're worried about what people will think. But just forget about that and keep driving and write down everything that comes to you. And then the next day, once you've reached your destination with the song, you go, right, is this where I want to be? And then you let the critic out. Mm-hmm. So um, I think it's important to know when you're writing a song that you don't know where it's going to end up and that's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and it might be that you don't use it, but it might be that you've found something in that song that you use for the next song because it's inspired something. And then that song ends up being the one that you really love. And yeah. that's okay. Yeah. So yeah, it's okay. very much a letting go of things, which can be quite difficult sometimes and letting go of the fear of stuff yes, <laughs> yes yeah. absolutely yeah well I quite like what she said with the metaphor with the car I thought that was quite I good. love that between the camel and the car I feel like I'm going to talk a lot <laughs> <laughs> put the camel in the boot as well <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly you're riding up front with a horse that's what you're doing <laughs> a horse-drawn car <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh, but I think that all works though that's just it's scary though. I mean, I haven't written a song for a while just because I haven't felt in a very creative place. Um, and then I do have a bit of the fear that's starting to creep in. So I need to take my own advice there really. Um, and just get over myself and get on with it. <laughs> it's not what we want you to do, but uh, it's easier said than done. Um, but when it comes to your releases and stuff, where is the best place to get updates on those? And where's the best place to be to hear what you're up to with it and what your plans are going to be? Yeah, if you want to kind of follow my journey, like little posts about it, if you go onto my Facebook page, you'll see Grace Foley Singer on Facebook, uh, Grace Foley Singer on Instagram, Grace F Singer on Twitter. I always try and keep little updates there. Um, and they get more detailed on my Patreon channel. So Patreon or Patreon page, I guess, is for anyone who doesn't know, is those, those people that keep us going financially. You give, um, well, for, on my page, you can give as little as five a month, five euro, and you get certain benefits back. And uh, those people get all the nitty gritty information first and they get behind the scenes. Behind the scenes for the last two months have been, um, you know, really me learning how to drive, uh, me learning how to work a ring light, me doing Facebook Lives. But it's still, it's interesting. There's still a lot happening behind the scenes. I've got clips of me hearing my song for the first time on the radio, that kind of thing. So th- that kind of detail and that kind of behind the scenes footage um, is, me, is on my Patreon page. But like everyday posts, I'm quite good to stay fairly present on, on Facebook and Instagram. Um, and then on YouTube, Grace Foley Singer is the first place they publicly can hear all my music. So like the next song is out on the 9th of June or the 9th. June. Grace, we're going forwards in the year. The 9th of August is the next <laughs> song. And that is going to be, apart from my Patreon page, who'll get to hear it first. And they get to see previews as well. Um, that will be out on the 9th of August. And that will, first of all, go up onto YouTube. Um, and that won't be up on my Facebook page for a link uh, for a number of weeks. Uh, my last release, Danny Boy, is still only available on YouTube. Uh, and then I put up my Facebook page in the near future. So I suppose, yeah, the, the YouTube following is a very important thing. 
um, your friend and mine, Emer Berry, was the one that was saying to me, Grace, you got to get on your YouTube game. I really, really did not realize um, how important. I really abandoned YouTube. I kind of did everything else. I was like, I'll throw it up there. Um, whereas now it's kind of my main port of call. So if people want to subscribe to Grace Foley Singer, it means the world to see those numbers. I've, there's something about that subscription number. If that can just go up, it's just a great feeling. So that's, that's the first port of call anyway. Yeah, it was actually Emo. I was talking to her about YouTube um, as well because her YouTube with Affinity is amazing. Amazing. Um, and she's given me a lot of advice and inspiration for my YouTube because I was the same as you. I'd neglected YouTube for years. Um, yeah. Just like thinking, oh my gosh, it's another social media channel. There's <laughs> just so many of them. Um, but then um, I think I was listening to a podcast where somebody said, if you're not on YouTube, like seriously, get your ass into gear because it's, it's the second largest search engine in the world, owned by yeah. Google, who is the first largest search engine in the world. And so if you're not on YouTube, you're missing out on all those people that are looking for stuff. Yeah. So that's why I thought, right, I've seriously got to start making the most of this channel now. And so in March, um, I made sure I had enough content um, to put up regular content. So now I've got the podcast, um every Tuesday at six um and then I put up a video every Friday at six as well it's a different kind of video um and having that consistency has really helped my subscriber numbers um, and watch hours and all that kind of thing and you're right when you see that somebody has subscribed to your channel it's it's the biggest compliment it like gives you a smile all day long it's good isn't it <laughs> it's a great feeling <laughs> It is, but um, I've done quite a bit of research on this now, and not only is it like a great feeling and makes us smile, but um, when people subscribe to your channel and they like your videos, it triggers something in the algorithm. So not only are they making you feel good uh, by subscribing to your stuff, but they're then enabling the algorithm to go, hang on a minute, that must mean that this channel's pretty good. And that must mean that this video is really good if people are liking it. So that must mean that if we share it to more people, more people are going to really like it. And that yes. grows your fan base exponentially. And so mm -hmm. just by pressing that subscribe button, you lovely people who are listening if you wouldn't mind just clicking the subscribe button Come on over. and going over to grace's <laughs> channel <laughs> the subscribe button is just to be like there somewhere um that is just helping us so much and it's something that doesn't cost anything either it's completely free um yep. so it's really nice when people are able to help you in that way they just go it's okay I believe in you, I've got you, I'm just gonna press this button, it's completely free for me, it doesn't disrupt any of my user experience on YouTube, if anything, it makes it better. Um, and that is such a great feeling that they're supporting you because it helps you in so many different ways. So I completely yeah. see what you're saying, especially when you're trying to grow a channel and you're putting so much effort into it, because it takes hours for me to do all of this video stuff for yeah. no financial return at all. So okay. it's such a compliment when somebody goes, yeah, I like that. And it, you like you've put your heart and soul into it, and hours of work into it. It's really nice when somebody goes like, you go, yay! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great feeling, and I hope they have more of that feeling <laughs> in the coming yeah. days. Yeah, exactly. But you're doing really well um, by putting it out on YouTube and Patreon first. Like that's such a good mm -hmm. idea, um, and that's something that I've been trying to do as well. Like I put little clips to my videos that are on YouTube on my social media. But then if you want to see the full video, it's on YouTube, um, and that's because I really want to drive traffic over here because I know it can be a great resource for artists and a, a great discovery tool for fans. Um, yeah. And then of course, when people are supporting you with a monthly monthly subscription on Patreon, the idea that you're able to give them stuff in advance and give them more behind the scenes stuff you're providing a service for them that they're then paying for but it's also helping you to create all that content and uh, to create music which is yeah. what your fans want you to do anyway isn't it that's all they want they're all, always wanting and like what's lovely is that the, the true the true fans want any little song at all like it doesn't have to be this big production they just want to hear you singing which is a really nice thing as well and i think i kind of think we can get in our own way a little bit i know i certainly can trying to think that everything has to be this professional video whereas it might not need to be every single time because that's that's why i have this and the light and everything so i want to do more things at home which is again i probably wouldn't have i was thinking about it for ages but i hadn't got the stuff or anything so i think that's going to be the way forward just creating as much content at home as possible and try to do it for free ish <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, I completely know what you're saying. Although the fear has got to me a bit just because the technology scares me and, uh, <laughs> and things like that. But I'm hoping that I'll be able to find a way past it because I was also talking to Daisy Shoot, who does a lot of live streams that are amazing. Um, and she was helping me with the various apps and platforms that she uses in order to make all the technology work. Because right. um, I was thinking, well, because I don't play an instrument, I, I have to make sure that I can play backing tracks from my computer yeah. Um, and that the audio is also going into my computer. So I need yeah. to make sure that the microphone is set up to the interface to then get into the computer. But then if I'm playing a backing track, it can't come out of these speakers. It's then got to make sure that it's matched volume wise. So then you've got to use this other thing that you just, uh, uh, <laughs> it's, all, it's, it's, uh, it's all, it's all there. I just, yeah, I, I, your face and my face. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, like, I see the pain. Yeah. Rabbit in headlights <laughs> at the moment. Oh my gosh. Um, I think. <laughs> goodness me. So I think what I'm going to try and do is um, maybe do a live stream, um, just maybe not using a micro like a proper microphone for now, um, just so I can get used to doing it and used to like a bare minimum technology and then build it up from there is kind of what I'm thinking. So it might be that I do um, some easy listening songs that are not going to require a lot of um belting because as soon as you get into like the more um stronger songs with the oper operatic style or a bit of belt going in there you don't want the microphone that you've got in in your laptop like the more simple one to distort if it does on the light and the live ones a lot it's really frustrating every, every yeah I'm, I'm so bloody loud and every time it gets to the top of the voice it's just so and i'm and what's weird is like in the room and i and i think that's what made me pull back from the lives i actually found i was i was holding back a little bit and it still was happening and i had mm -hmm. the phone so far away at this point that i actually thought if i go any further back i'm going to be so far away from the thing and then i was trying to come back over look at the comments and then go back again uh yeah i find that frustrating because you can't open up you can't fully you're so scared it's going to go which it did on like every i listened back and i was like oh all the high notes were kind of even if i was trying to just be so careful they just peak a little bit so yeah mm. and i think you can like if i did it through this maybe you can control it better i don't know i just got this <laughs> the boxes are still over there so i don't know <laughs> yeah i think there are um, to teach me you know. <laughs> yeah I, I know i need a bit of help with it as well because um i think there are some pedals that you can get um that add a bit of compression when you're doing a live stream but then you don't want your voice compressed too much and then it's another bit oh. of kit that you've got to buy when you've got no money coming in because of covid Ugh. and <laughs> so, there's just oh there's just so many ways of of doing it but then getting all the technology to speak to each other and, and get it all right and then be able to control the levels while you're singing is mm. it's a big deal it's something quite massive to deal with when you're not used to it um, and then also it's, it's then going out to however many thousands of people on the internet that might see this. Um, so you want it to reflect your best work as well. Um, so, so many different things to deal with. It is complicated. I think the um, thing is though, by sharing um, the complications that there are with it and the amount of things you've got to think about, hopefully it will then instill, instill understanding within your audience. Yeah. So they go, look, I know she's got a lot to deal with right now. Um, and so it just allows people to be more forgiving, potentially. Yeah, yeah that's, it, that's it, what it I'm hoping. Us, it makes us, yeah, I think so. I think, and I get what you mean. I think the honesty helps because otherwise you're kind of trying to pretend everything's fine, but it's better just to say like, I'm sorry, it did peak a little bit there. It was a bit distorted and just kind of explain that, that can happen. Because what I worry about is if you hear that sound, does it feel like almost like you're going, she's a bit loud and then you're kind of going no no no. in the room it's fine well I'm loud but like in the room it's I'm not like unbearably loud it's just it can come across as like is she unbearably loud in reality if that's what that sound makes it's just it's a weird one when I hear it back I kind of go oh god does that just sound off um but it's good to just explain to people that no it doesn't in reality it's not like that it's just teeny tiny microphones that weren't meant for singing not classical yeah. singers anyway exactly and not opera like people who are classically trained we've got the big lungs for it you know we're supposed to be able to project and have our voices heard in big rooms you know we're trained for that and then when you're dealing with this little microphone it goes but i'm only used to speech please don't yeah. sing into me <laughs> yeah. please stop my poor phone i'd say it's just like please 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 no 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 more <laughs> but you're right it like sounds great in a room because that's what you're used to singing in you know um but then when you're trying to deal with technology that's not used to it 
it's, it's so difficult because you can't, it's like, I'd love to be able to talk logically to technology. That would be great. Where you just go, look, this is what I'm trying to do. And then technology goes, okay, in which case you've got to do this, this, and this, but yeah. it doesn't. Instead, it just goes, no. <laughs> 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 and you're like, but why no? And it just goes, no. 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 And you, do, you get no explanation as to why with any of this stuff. It just goes, nope. no. <laughs> I especially love when it just crashes. It just crashes for no reason. <gasps> no reason. Oh, no, my okay. gosh. You go back in, it's like, oh, this project doesn't exist. You're like, it existed two minutes ago. Yeah. 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 I feel your pain. Yes, I do. 100% I do. Um, I do. I'm hoping it's okay. If I go back to something that you said earlier in our conversation yes. um, and just ask if you'd be willing to share a little bit more. If you're not, that's absolutely fine. Um, but when you said that you had to take a step back from singing and you mm. didn't fancy singing for a while and you had to find your reason why to come back. Um, yeah. Do you mind if I ask you why you felt like you needed to step away? Because it sounds like that's yeah. quite a raw emotion that you're holding there. So don't feel like you have to say anything. No, no, it's fine. I've, I've spoken about it a few times. I don't go into massive detail, but uh, I had a negative experience with singing um, in my college years. And I think I like, I even hear myself, I use the phrase, I stepped away. I don't know if I had much of a choice because my voice stopped working. Um, so when I say I stepped away, I had no choice. Um, I realized it was a disconnect between the heart and the voice. Um, I felt very unsure of myself as a person because of what had happened in college. And I suppose I just lost myself completely. And I'm so careful of that now. And what happened was I just started to freeze up because I just wasn't looking back on it. I wasn't myself. I was trying to be this other person um, for that particular time in my life. And I just couldn't fit into the box. And I think like it's like at the time you're frustrated you've got why won't this stupid thing work and you make it worse because you're kind of going come on and you force it and you force it and you get all tight and tense and because it got worse and worse I wasn't listening to what it was telling me it was telling me you're not happy uh you're not enjoying singing uh you're feeling a little bit threatened and I guess I started to lose myself um during that time and because of that I had lost the reason I think it's a huge thing I'm always like what's the reason I'd lost certainly lost the reason to sing um, I kept pushing because I felt I should be doing this and I kept pushing, 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 pushing until the voice gave me loads of signs and loads of hints that it's like, I'm going to stop working. Um, and what's frustrating is it wasn't that my voice just like disappeared because I walked onto a stage and just roared and it just stopped working. I couldn't get it out. I could not get it. Just, I'd be like, I, nothing it was, I, apparently it's the same thing um in golf and in darts it's the yips so like sometimes a dart if you're playing darts you can't you can't let go if you're playing golf you get stuck mid-swing so it's the, it's called the yips and i spoke to somebody about it at the time and they said you've got the yips where you're like and it just you can't continue on and i just for like now in my 30s um i realized that that was my body's my very intelligent body's way and mind and heart's way of telling me you've got to look at your situation really. Cause that's why I suppose when I said about finding my voice back in the church, um, I was, my why became more apparent again. Mm -hmm. uh, and I found like, it's okay to be me. It's okay to be the person that I am. I don't need to be this type of singer. Uh, like even when I said, I didn't enter the opera world willingly. Uh, I did have a lovely experience. I did take part. I, I was um, Zita in Jenny Skiki, the Puccini opera in college. And, but that was, it was a real um, ensemble piece. So I loved that. So that, that absolutely had experiences. I worked with Opera Ireland in the chorus. I enjoyed it. But I guess it wasn't me. Um, I knew that. I wouldn't even say that deep down. I knew that. And a lot of singers um, couldn't, I suppose my fellow singers were always actually super. They were great. I never had an experience. A lot of people have very negative experiences with singers. They say, oh God, they were mean or whatever. I didn't. I got on great with all the other singers in the college. But I still, I could see their frustration in terms of I had this big voice that would lend itself very nicely to an opera. It, it sounds like an operatic voice. And I kept pulling away from it. And my singing teacher at the time actually said, they're probably frustrated with you. And a number of people said they just couldn't understand why I wouldn't do this. And the more I tried to fight against my natural inclination, the more my voice started going, no, 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 no. So it's just, and like I spoke to, kind of a professional at the time I said like this is happening he was a guy that like had worked with 
um, sports people before. And I said, like, is it like a sports psychology issue? Do I need to figure out? And it was quite scary, actually. And it's something that I say to people all the time, nothing to do with music. If there's something that you're not happy with, if you're very unhappy or you're, it's going against the grain, as my mom always says, was it going against the grain? And you're pushing, your body will keep showing you little signs. So like, I kept getting like, knots in my jaw then I got like a wisdom tooth issue which could have happened anyway but that locked my jaw then I kept getting sore throats then I kept getting sinus infections then I, got, I locked up here I got costochondritis which is like inflammation along here I got that I ignored all this I was like I need to I need to sing classically so I kept pushing pushing, pushing. and eventually it stopped right and I said to him oh my god and he said this is not as bad as it can get if you don't listen to whatever it is your body's trying to tell you you're going to get sick and I mean you're going to get sick sick and you will keep getting sicker so he said, this is going to be the least of your worries if you don't. Start. So like, it's like, I probably the most honest I've ever been about it is on here, but like, it's just something that I want people, especially anyone listening, that if you're pushing, even if it's something that seems like the best idea in the world for you and something's going against your personality, listen, because your body is absolutely telling you, but don't ignore. So that's kind of, I know it's a bit deep and a bit heavy, but that's, that's kind of what happened to me without going into the details of what happened. <laughs> Well, thanks ever so much for feeling like it was okay to dive into it with us because I just, I, it was a question that kept coming back to me as we were talking, but what happened? <laughs> because you're just, you're so amazing and so brilliant now with all your singing. Like, I can't imagine something like that being in your past, if that makes sense. So that's yeah. a huge hurdle that you've had to overcome. Um, and I really admire you for that. That's a lot of work um as mentally and physically to then get past mm -hmm. something like that so you know i i 100 admire you for it um and the other reason why i wanted to ask you about it was really from a personal perspective in that um i have been struggling myself during lockdown to do any classical singing um and it's just because normally i i, like, I practice stuff for shows and now they're gone and i go but well, you know, I don't have any shows coming up, so I don't have these things that I'm practicing. So I just haven't done any classical singing for ages. Um, and that's scared me as well. I've thought, well, but why don't I want to? Um, because I've always wanted to before. And I've just kind of lost that feeling of, oh, but I should, and I need to do this, and I'm going to enjoy it. And, you know, and to have that, like, that rug swept away from you underneath your feet mm -hmm. has just sent me on a bit of a wonky pattern so like for a few weeks ago and a few days ago, I've like, I've been singing along to some of my old favorite songs like um, uh, Cheryl Crow's first album I was listening to when I was growing up um, and Alanis Morissette's Jagged Little Pill album. You know, the, these songs I was listening to when I was growing up um, and started singing more of those again. And it's sort of given me more enjoyment back into singing um, mm. because there's there's more pressure about it now as well. It's not just all my shows have gone it's when a show's coming back when is that income coming back where is my next paycheck coming from holy moly what am I going to do now mm -hmm. and then yeah. that amount of pressure to descend on you has, has made me go a bit wonky as well does that make sense a hundred percent and I I think we're all lost in that fog a little bit definitely um like again I think I always come back to like what's your what's the reason what's your why for singing anymore and like it can be hard in the middle of all this to find a reason to sing it can be I mean I've I've done so I've done well so far to find reasons to sing because I had to um but I did find in the last week I thought oh it's just trying to keep that constant you know that that reason um and I think when you've had like I didn't have loads of shows cancelled I wasn't sure what I was going to be doing it's, it's a tough one where in terms of where I met in my career, because I'm in County Kerry, which is very much um, traditional music. It's tourism. It's a couple of shows in, in Killarney, where I'm from. I'm not involved in them. And so it, I was just trying to build a name. Um, you, you, you had shows. I can't even imagine what that would be like to have like a run of shows cancelled for the rest of the year, because I think we, I think maybe that's why I, I said, I'd love, I hate the idea of having nothing planned for the rest of the year. I think I said that to you when we just maybe wasn't on this podcast, but when we were speaking earlier on, and I think we need a reason. That's why I think that I'm trying to hold on to something that maybe in December I can sing for somebody. At the moment, you're, you, as you said, we normally work towards something. And you have, from what I've heard, you've got your recording done um, and you've got, you've, you've practiced for all those shows, but now they're gone. Um, so what's, you know, what can we, 
find as a reason <laughs> to do it. You can't just, I don't think just singing for singing's sake is always going to work. I don't think that's, I don't think that romantic notion is true. I don't think it is. Um, so I think maybe it's the reason for singing is what's, maybe it's going to be your journey for the rest of the year and try and figure what that is. Maybe we get later in the year and we'll start to feel that it's more certain of what's happening next year. I think that's what's scary as well. We don't, and not to make it worse, but like we don't know what's happening next year. You know, so it's not even like we go, okay, January, we're on the road again. Like, because that's, the year, the year can be going quite fast in some ways. So maybe that's okay. But I think it's totally understandable the way you're feeling, especially when you have all these shows cancelled. Like that's, like no need to say sorry to hear that. That's, that's awful. I think that's what, it, you're right, is, is your why. And my why before was because I get to have that amazing connection with people from the stage. Yeah. And that's what I love so mm-hmm. much. Um and then to then have that gone, you go in well, <laughs> I don't even have words to describe yeah. the feeling of, uh. <laughs> yeah. um, it feels like everything's kind of disappearing underneath you a little bit. That's what I kind of like a quicksand kind of situation. That's how I felt the last week. So maybe that's what you're feeling as well. Just this, like I said to my husband yesterday, so I feel a bit like, uh, I don't know, like nothing's happened in the last couple of weeks, but I feel a bit like I've nothing to grab onto. Like, I mean, I've got mm. my projects coming up, but I think it's that feeling of not having people not having uh, that connection and I suppose it's, I presume it's the same for for yourself like we're not meant to be close to anybody anybody even that we love um so like bar the people that we live with and maybe in a bubble I don't know it's it's, it's different everywhere but yeah I find I met a musician recently um they called my house and they sat well away from me and even at that I hadn't seen her in years and she came in and we we're just discussing possibly doing something maybe next year or something and just when she came to the door my automatic response would be to be like oh hey quick hug and that's gone and it's just that horrible uh, uh, like you can't grab onto anything you can't you can't and you're kind of dreading meeting somebody because you're going to go it's going to be very awkward now that I have to tell you I can't hug you I can't shake your I'm not meant to shake your hand um and then we can't go on stage and we can't connect with people either so I think as an artist and as a human being it goes completely against our hearts and our souls to be completely unconnect disconnected to people on every level on a daily level as well as on a stage so I think it's just I think it's okay for us to feel this way at the moment because I think we're not alone. At least, at least we're all kind of in this together. But yeah, I, I get, I, I think it's very, very honest what you're saying. And I think it is very obvious why you feel the way you do because I think we're all kind of the same. Yeah, it is time. It's definitely times like this that make me feel so, so grateful for the um, friendships with my fans that I've built up before this point mm-hmm. because. I know that I can go online um, and I can voice these opinions um, and they'll, they'll understand, you know, because, because they know me now um, and because we've got such a great connection, like I'm so happy and so grateful for that. Um, so it's nice when you feel like you will have that support to get you through this mm. massive tidal wave ride that, you ride that you're going through at the moment, yeah. you know? Um, so I do feel so grateful for that and and when i was doing my marketing course during lockdown um and i was just like sat there looking at my computer screen for upwards of eight ten twelve hours a day <laughs> trying to get it oh, done. Oh. Oh, i think i actually put out a tweet at one point going i feel like i'm the only human left maybe like all the people out there are now just automated um by the government because it's just to make you feel like you're not so alone <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> am i the only human left on the planet now oh um but then you do get those personal responses coming back to you and you know that people are feeling the same way and you are all in this together apart um yes. and so that does then make you feel a bit better um yes but it's, it's, I've really had to focus a lot on my um, mindset recently um, and trying to shift um, the way I'm feeling. Because sometimes I get up in the morning and I go, I've got nothing in the diary for today. And it's amazing how that one statement can make you feel so completely different depending on what your mindset is. Like I've had days where I've woken up going, I don't have anything in the diary today. And I've gone, that's amazing. I can do everything. I can do so many things that I want to do. And I've been quite excited about it. And then I've had other days where I've gone, I have nothing in the diary today. This makes me feel very sad. Yeah. Because it's, I have nothing it's, it's, in the diary and I just... <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's such a psychological thing. And you said you can have such a different reaction to the, the same thing. Like this morning, I was feeling a bit like, like you, Finny, but ugh, and I took out my diary and obviously there's never really anything in it um I was like I have a podcast today which is nice but also I filled in 
like a to-do list. I'm a to-do list kind of person. And I felt a bit like, oh. And then I was like, no, I actually have plenty of things I need to do. Like there's all stuff in our business and there's plenty to do. So I actually wrote them down. I ha- and I had been doing that the whole way through lockdown until last week. And I was like, I think I've most, most things done. Which And then I made another list today. And I was like, I felt better because... I suppose that's in lieu of a diary. It's kind of like you get to check it off and like, I'm achieving. I'm still yes. achieving. But I'm, that, I'm a list folders person. I, I like to organize these things. Me the too. Person. Yeah, <laughs> honestly, pages of lists everywhere. Because I always feel like there is something else that I could be doing. Um, always. <laughs> but uh, I've been thinking, well, if I'm not being creative in terms of making music right now, because it is difficult for people to get together, um, I have sometimes felt quite excited about shifting the creative creativity into other areas, like right. thinking about what really cool creative merch ideas I can come up with for my next pre-order campaign um, that will be coming up in a few months. And that's been quite exciting because I've been thinking, well, what can I create um, as part of the pre-order for this new album that people are going to really love? Um, yeah. And that's made me feel quite excited because it's another way of being creative. Um, when I'm not able to be so creative with music right now. It's nice to have another outlet, but so you feel like you're still achieving things. I think that's yeah. the main point. Um, Cause I had a day, I think it was when my marketing course had finished. I thought, right, I'll have a day off, I'll do nothing. And I was really looking forward to it. Cause I was thinking, right, I've got my Galaxy Caramel bar in the fridge. I was very excited about this. Very excited about that. Um, and I had my tea that I really like. Um, Tea is important to me. It's my fuel. It's what I run off. (laughs) Um, So I have my tea and I have my chocolate and I was going to watch Friends episodes all day. Um, I was very excited about this. And it got to midday and I thought, I haven't done anything. And it didn't actually make me feel any good. I'd like, I think maybe if I'd have spent my time off being creative and at least creating something, even if it was just doing some painting or doing a bit of my sewing that I like doing. I would have enjoyed my time off, but I also would have achieved something as well. And I remember saying to Ema, our mutual friend actually, um, that I was feeling this way. And she was like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense that you can have downtime, but then still achieve something. And I think that's the way I need to have my time off. I've kind of discovered that about myself throughout this whole thing. Yeah. And so it's giving myself a way of having time off, but still being creative. Because I think that even though all my shows are cancelled, I've still got that creativity as a, as a tr- personality trait that still needs to come out somehow. It has to come out somewhere. We've, we've painted every room that we hadn't painted in this house. <laughs> move that there and move that there and we get this mirror. And actually, I was on a hive when I was doing that because I was like, ooh, creativity. And then that stopped. And the place looks nice now. And I'm like, okay, uh, I must organise. I, I think it's a constant craving of creating. Um, it's like a drug. And at the moment our fix is a bit more complicated to get. <laughs> so I think we have to become really, really creative. And in terms of merch and everything, I'm gonna have to talk to you off air at some stage because I have no idea about any of that. So it's just so interesting to talk to another singer and just learn about all these. Some people ask me, what other merch do you have? And I was like, uh, I mean, I did. I do have one t-shirt that I own for my last album and that's it. <laughs> yeah, I've been looking into this a lot recently. So um, I'm more than happy to share ideas. Um, there's one thing that I probably, oh, I'm not sure if I should say. Um, I, maybe I will mention it. Um, there's one particular piece of merch that is the most special and exclusive bit of merchandise I have ever been able to offer. Right. But, okay, so I had an amazing photo shoot with a guy called Guy Bellingham. And um, he had handmade and crafted a replica vintage camera from 1920s Hollywood. Like, so clever. Holy moly, it's clever. Um, And he had the the brightest lights in the world shining on me while we were doing this photo shoot. and these are the pictures that I'm using um, across all my social media now. So me sort of side on with the camera, uh, with the camera pointing here and the microphone. Um, that's, that, that was from that photo shoot. And oh my gosh, what he creates is amazing. But he's like a real enthusiast for that old technology um, and those lost arts. 
Um, and something that he's able to do is a tin plate. I'm going to have to work, like, find out more about how this works. Because when he first showed me, I was like asking him all kinds of questions, really excited about it. Um, but you know how like old photographs used to be um, developed before they had like paper that they did it on. They used to do yeah. it on glass um, or on a specially treated um, plate of metal. Um, and so he's bringing back these old ways of developing photographs that have been lost really. It's like quite a lost technology. There are only a handful of people who can do this in the whole world. Wow. That much of a lost art that he's bringing back. Um, and it costs a lot of money to create these because they take so much time and effort and expertise to make. But he got this plate of metal that was specially treated with all these very specialist chemicals. Um, and then he exposes that plate to the picture that he took. Um, and then he puts real silver onto the plate. Um, and it goes into all the right places because of how the light is on it. Like I'm not, it's such an intricate process. I'm not entirely sure yeah. how it works. And then he develops that and it's a picture of you that's then immortalized like for hundreds of years this will last for in real silver. Oh, wow. Like, oh my God. How oh amazing God. is that? I just <laughs> like, when he sent me this, it blew my mind. I was like, goodness gracious me. I had no idea it was even possible. And then it's this gorgeous glinting picture that looks like jewelry. It's like that beautiful and that amazing and glinting and special and like, oh my gosh. Um, so I'm talking to him now about how I might be able to offer that as part of the pre-order campaign for the new album wow. using the album artwork that I shot with him to right. create these real silver pictures. Oh my God. That's I'm amazing. so excited. <laughs> oh. <laughs> God, I can't wait. That sounds amazing. I can't even like, my brain can't even like imagine. I can't wait to see that. I know. Oh, well, my oh my gosh. I'm so excited about it. But because it's such a um, specialist process, he'll only be able to do like very few. So right. this will so be a be, very... Your big fans will obviously want to get this straight away. Well, I hope they'll like it. I'm so excited about it. I want one for me. I, <laughs> I, guess you're, I presume you're going to have one. <laughs> 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 I hope there'll be one left for me, yeah, because I... Oh, you'll have to have one. <laughs> <laughs> but he can only do so many because, because of how long the process takes and because of how specialist these components are. Yeah. He can only do very few of them. Um, so they're going to be like the most special and amazing thing I think I've ever been able to offer anyone ever. <laughs> and a limit, limited edition as well, which is really cool. Yeah, so like that's probably the one thing I'm not sure if I should have said that or not, but it's <laughs> I won't tell anyone. <laughs> These people listening probably won't either. <laughs> <laughs> I just I, to be fair, I'd been holding it in for a few months, so I'd done well. I'd like I don't well. think I'd be holding everybody. it well enough. <laughs> I was just oh just Okay, maybe I got too excited and shouldn't have said anything, but it's just, it's really exciting. Um, but yeah, oh I have God, been looking at other cool. merch as well. So like, I'd more than happily send you my list that I've compiled. Fab, thank you so much. That'd be great. And I can't wait to see the silver. <laughs> and I think you're just, you probably just created excitement about it now. So I wouldn't worry about getting that word out there before you planned on saying it, you know? <laughs> I hope it's that awesome. people are going to be as excited as me because I'm so <laughs> excited about it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, Maybe it's a good thing that I said something because I'll just, I'll, hopefully if I can share that excitement and finally have it burst out of me as well. It's nice to have something to feel excited about. It is. We're trying to clutch onto excited straws these days. I mean, it is, <laughs> there's, it's every day you're like, okay, okay. Um, like I was very excited about this arriving. Um, I'm not so excited about learning how to work it. So that was short lived. <laughs> like I like going into a studio and that's exciting, but then you've got the bit where you have to listen to yourself back singing 75 times. That note that you're like, oh God, and they're like, it's fine, we'll fix that later. And you're like, oh, I can't listen to it anymore. So I hate that bit. And then there's all the bits in the middle. And then you get the CD, you got the record or whatever, and it's exciting. So yeah, I get what you mean. Like the, there's very few things that you can be genuinely so excited about. So you've got this to look forward to, which is, that's amazing. That's so cool. I'm so glad we've had this chat today. You've made me feel so much better about life, the world and Me everything. <laughs> I'm so pleased. <laughs>
<laughs> it works both ways, believe me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad I could chat to you because it's you're right. It's nice to have things to look forward to. It's nice to have things to be excited about. Um, and it's great hearing that you do have those things to be excited about. Like you've got this exclusive content you're making on your Patreon. You're writing your own music. You're releasing all these things. You've got the grant to be able to get you to like record more music. That is so exciting. So. Thank you so much for sharing so much of your exciting news and your upcoming stuff with it with us and, and for being so honest about what happened to you in your past as well. Like that's really kind of you to share so much of yourself with us. So thank, thank you so, you much, so much. Thank you. And it's been it's been so lovely and it's great to connect with somebody. I feel like we know each other really well now. And it's just yeah. and I I try and find the positives and I as I said, maybe I'm sure our paths would have crossed at some stage, but maybe not this soon. I mean, we both needed to have this conversation today. So the serendipity of it all has been fabulous. So just thank you, Mary Jess, so much for having me on. 100%. The serendipity of it all, 100%. Thank you so much. You've just, thank you've you. made my day. You've made me feel so much happier. So thank you so much, Grace Foley, for joining me on the Mary Jess Meets podcast. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, Bye, darling. Bye.